Welcome back to another Fighter Heart Podcast. I'm Joe Rizzo, and today I'm here with McKenna. Hi, hey, McKenna. Hey, how are you? It's good to see you. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Thanks for coming on. Um, what we like to do here is, you know, get into like a brief background about who you are, you know, where you're from and stuff. And then, you know, just get right into your fighter heart story and we'll do it more conversationally. So, you know, if I have any comments, I'll chime in, but we'd love to hear your story. Yeah, sounds great. I really appreciate you having me on today. Um, my name is McKenna Gear. I am a three-time Paralympian in the sport of rifle shooting. Um, so I grew up, I was uh, actually born with my disability. Um, so it's something that I've been dealing with my entire life and have learned uh, how to overcome a lot of different uh issues, I guess, if you will, throughout my life. Um, but first surgery that I had, I was about a year old to correct my uh, clubbed foot. Um, I was born with arthrogryposis, so affected the way that my muscles and joints were uh, formed in utero. Um, so the worst it was ever going to be was when I was born. I uh, can only can continue to improve what I had from there. Um, when I was first born, you know, my parents were given a lot of um, she won't be able to do this. She can't do that. She'll never keep up with peers. Um, and they did not want that to affect my life moving forward. So can't was a word that was not in our family vocabulary. Um, if you couldn't do it uh, the normal way, if you will, uh, you figured out a way to adapt it and um, may look a little bit different, but that's okay. Um, so I started going to a summer camp for kids with disabilities when I was five. And uh, the purpose of this camp was to adapt the outdoors for us kids. So anything and everything you could think of, this disabled vet that started the camp had it available. Hand cycles and rugby chairs and um, inner tubing on the local lift lake kayaks one of the uh and then one of the mornings the younger kids went bowling while the older kids went shooting so the year I turned 12 I got to go shooting with the big kids and just had a blast I absolutely loved it thought it was the coolest what were thing you shoot, what were you shooting when you're 12 is it like a like a airsoft gun or something or is it like you were actually shooting 22 rifles on an outdoor range oh wow yeah, so that's why we had to be 12. It was the minimum age to be at that range that was nearby the camp. So, uh, And that's where it all started. That's where it started. So <laughs> I had known the camp director for about uh, seven years at that point. So we were pretty close friends. And he saw how much fun I was having and asked if I wanted to shoot a competition that he was hosting about six months later. Um, and what was funny, it was actually on the way to wheelchair basketball practice on Saturdays. Um <laughs> So my mom, I took up her whole Saturday driving me around to different sporting events, um, but <laughs> I got to train for about a month and then shot this competition and actually ended up beating my camp director at his own competition, which I thought was pretty crazy, pretty fun. It took him a that couple of years to admit it. That was when you were 13, you said? or is that Yeah, still? probably about 13. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. what you beat him right away. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that was really neat. And then... Um, because of that little competition that I shot, I was put in contact with the Paralympic coach at the time. And a year and a half ish after I shot at summer camp for the first time, I was out at the Olympic and Paralympic training center for my first um, camp and competition. How old were you then? 14 ish. So two years later. Yeah. Yeah. So what is it? How do you qualify? Are there like, uh, like any other sport qualifying events leading up to it? Yeah, I would say every sport is super different. And for shooting, we had this year, um, we had three qualifying events leading up to the games. You had to shoot at least two of them. Um, so if you had, you know, medical issue, couldn't attend one of them, you could still qualify for the team, uh, which is actually uh, the only reason that I was able to qualify. So, <laughs> so I don't really know. I'm not familiar with shooting. Like I've all I've done is like shoot the clays like once or twice at like a shooting range, but like for the uh for the Olympics, I assume it's like different rules. Like what are the rules? How does it work? Yeah, so Olympic Paralympic uh rifle shooting. Um we have two different distances that we can shoot at. So we have 10 meter and 50 meter. The 10 meter is shot with an air rifle, so it's a 177 caliber pellet. And then the 50 meter event is shot outdoors with a 22 caliber rifle. Uh, uh, we're shooting 
most of the event formats um, are 60 shots in the course of about an hour to an hour and 15 minutes. And they are adding up the score on all 60 of those shots. So every single one of them matters. Um, we're scored on how close or how much of the bullseye we can cover. Um, because we are shooting on some really fancy electronic target systems to make life even more entertaining for us, not only are we scored on if we're hitting the bullseye or not, but it can break down each scoring ring into tenths of millimeters. So if you just barely graze the edge of the bullseye, you get a 10.0. If you perfectly cover the bullseye with the pellet or the bullet, you get a 10.9, our highest score. Um, well, it's a 10.9 that throws me off. <laughs> I, it's a little I, it's a little bit different. Yeah. I have yeah. an 11. So the highest score that you can get is a 10.9. Uh, okay. Okay. So I guess you can't, it's not an, impossible to achieve an 11 then. Yeah. I was going to say we don't have an 11. So yes, yeah. get that one, but 10.9 is a perfect shot. Um, so with our 10 meter events, the rifle target is the size of a silver dollar. Um, and the bullseye in the middle is a period in a newspaper. It's a half millimeter dot. Oh my God. Yeah. That's so wild. if you're thinking about that decimal scoring system, they're breaking that half millimeter dot into tenths of millimeters to get that scoring. So you, I mean, I, I suppose a 10.9 never happens really. Um, they are actually, they're not rare. Oh. Um, I oh. wouldn't say you're shooting them on every single shot by any means. Um, but it's not unusual to see, you know, a couple of them, handful of them sprinkled throughout a match. Wow. And you don't have like a, a scope, right? It's we do just not. Like aiming, right? Yep. I was going to say we have peep sights. So a series of circles stacked on top of each other. Um, no magnification is allowed. If we, um, need a, you know, prescription lens, we are allowed to use that to correct our vision. Well, yeah. Wow. But that's crazy. So <laughs> I don't even know how 10.9 is possible based on what you just explained. So <laughs> that's why you're a professional. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's crazy. So what uh, what was your regimen? I'll go back a little bit. Like when you were like 14, 13, 14, 15, you know, leading up to it, like what? how often do you train, you know, and like how did you think, all right, I want to stick with this? Yeah, so after shooting at the uh, training center for the first time, I was just hooked into the sport. I loved how personal it was. It was really about bettering yourself, because um, if you're paying attention to what your competitors are doing, you're not focused on what you need to be doing. Yeah. Um, so got to shoot that first match, and then after my dad uh, had really seen how um, motivated and dedicated that I wanted to be with the sport, he actually cleared a path caddy corner through his woodworking shop that we had on our property um, to set up a target system for me. So um, he pushed all his woodworking stuff to the side so that I could train. Um, I was in high school at that point in time. So training, you know, typically took place in the afternoons uh, after school and homework was taken care of. Um, and that's pretty much how I continued until I graduated high school in 2014. About a week after uh, that graduation, I moved into the Olympic and Paralympic Training Center and became a resident athlete. So then it really got to become like my full time job. Oh, I didn't even know that's an option. So you live. It's like college for sports. Like, yeah, sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like that's crazy. That's cool. So how, yeah, what, I was gonna... how long are you there for? Well, it's a year program. So at the end of the year, if you're doing really well, doing what you're supposed to be doing, keeping up with, you know, training and all of the extras, if you will, that they have on complex. So like strength and conditioning, sports psych, uh, sports med, uh, your nutritionist, um, they will re can renew your residency. So year by year. Um, so in total across my career, I have been a resident for about 10 years. Oh, wow. So they can keep renewing it for like um, forever, like basically. And I say if you, as long as you are still meeting the criteria uh, for your sport and showing that you are still good enough uh, to be um, pursuing medals on the world stage. Wow, that's so cool. You're not in like a dorm though, right? It's not like a college. So it is dorms. If you're living on complex, they also have an off complex resident program, they call it. So you get all the same perks of, um, 
you know, your training venue, you get full access to your strength coach, sports med, sports psych, nutrition. Uh, you just don't have a dorm room. So yeah. my husband and I got married at the end of 2019. I switched from the on complex residency to off complex. I got you. Does he, is he a shooter too? Is he like he an used athlete? To be. He used to be, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, that's actually how we met. One of the first competitions I attended at the training center, he was, uh, he lived in the area, so trained there on a regular basis and kind of got voluntold to help the new Paralympic athletes that had no idea what we were doing, so. <laughs> Very cool. Um, what would you say is your most, um, your biggest accomplishment so far? Um, I would say biggest accomplishment in shooting uh, would yeah. definitely be uh, the Rio 2016 Paralympic Games. I actually won bronze in one of my air rifle events. Rio 2016. So you went there? Wow. Yeah. So I've been to, uh, was in Rio in 2016 and then Tokyo technically in 2021 for the delayed uh, COVID games. And mm -hmm. then Paris will be my my third. Oh, so you're there now? Is that? I leave next week. Oh, and leave next week. Yeah. So it happened already. You already had your competition. No, I no. Sorry, I leave for Paris next week. Oh, you leave for Paris. Next yeah. Week. Oh, I got yeah. It. So the Paralympic Games always start two weeks after the Olympics end. Uh, same city, same venues. Um, so give them a chance to take a break, let the volunteers, you know, catch up on some sleep, and uh, then we take over. So I might see you on TV then. It's very possible. Yeah, that'd be cool. <laughs> I so fix uh opening ceremony is august 28th and okay. i start i start competition on the 30th 11 days uh 12 days 13 days okay so you're ready to go yep what does training look like how long are you out like in your uh dad's garage shooting you know like or in the side of it or whatever uh dad's garage um since we were shooting after high school um classes were over um would typically be a little bit shorter a little bit different than what it looked like at the training center um i would probably get you know maybe two or three hours in the afternoon and evening but every um, day dependent depending you know i was pretty active in the high school as well so would uh definitely need to i, I would say i would say I trained anywhere from i, I want to say three to five days a week at that point yeah so as we were getting closer to a competition, I would definitely up it closer to five. But if we, you know, didn't have any pressing competitions coming up, you know, the sport takes a lot of sacrifice. So it would maybe focus on a little bit more of the social aspect of life instead. Is that what you were sacrificing, like the social life a little bit? Yeah, that, that would say that's typically one of the biggest sacrifices that us athletes have to make is families. Any, yeah, I think any athlete, right? Yeah, no matter what sport you're playing. Because you have families. <laughs> well, yeah. hopefully they can live with you on campus. So <laughs> I would say they don't live with us on on <laughs> complex. That's why that they have that off complex residency program. Yeah, yeah. All right, cool. So we'll look at you. We'll look out for you in a couple weeks. Um, Appreciate it. Yeah, for sure. Do you have any words for someone like that maybe grew up with the same kind of um, disorder? Where and like, what would you tell them? You know, if talking to your younger self i would say yeah me or my younger or i say my, my younger self or any other kids i would really just tell them um not to let other people's limitations limit their life um nobody knows what you can do except for yourself nobody knows how you are capable of adapting things until you are the one to try it so don't let don't let can't control your life and uh really pursue whatever it is you want to pursue did people try and tell you you can't do something when you were younger uh i was uh, just straight up from a baby people told me that i wouldn't be able to walk or talk read <laughs> keep up with peers i was saying uh, now i uh i have my master's degree in business administration i'm working on a graduate certificate of accounting like i can walk i can obviously talk pretty well um <laughs> so I've shattered all of those barriers right from the start um but and you're traveling all over the world <laughs> yeah, that, <laughs> literally uh that too um but yeah i was saying and on top of that as well um this quad has been looked a lot different than any previous quad for me because i actually had uh, my daughter at the beginning of 2013 or i'm sorry 2023 um so big she's <laughs> yeah big difference uh 
So my daughter's about a year and a half now, um, but that signif significantly impacted uh, qualifying for this Paris Games because um, I was on maternity leave up until the beginning of 2024. So USOPC is very generous. They give us a year after a child is born to return to basically where we were oh, for cool. pregnancy. Um, so I returned four days after my maternity leave ended um, for the second part of paratrials. That's why it matters that we don't have to attend all three of them because <laughs> um, I was unable to attend the first part. Um, but yeah, four days after that maternity leave ended, came back for paratrials part two. Um, and I was not expecting to be able to come back into the sport the way that I did. Um I expected, you know, scores to take a little bit of a dip to not be training at, you know, the same level that I was prior to the pregnancy um, and birth of my daughter. And we, I, I did, I came back really well. And I think it not only surprised myself, but definitely surprised my coach too. So it was kind of a whirlwind. I didn't think that I was going to have the time to qualify for Paris. Um, month after that maternity leave ended, I was going to India for a world cup to start the qualification process. Um, finished up the third and final part of para trials in April. Um, I was uh, leading our national selection procedure. So I just needed to go earn one more because there's a, for us, it's a two part international um, requirement. So you have to have two international scores at different events. So I then went to Peru in July and earned that second score, um, which is when I was able to qualify for my 13th. Yeah, you needed to. Yeah. Were you training while you were pregnant? I, so, uh, it was, that was a little bit complicated. Um, so I yeah. found out that I was pregnant, um, about three weeks before I was supposed to travel to, um, France, actually the same range that I'm going to go compete on here in a couple weeks. Wow. Um, they were hosting, um, the first qualifying competition for the Paris games in June of 2022. Um, I knew that I was going to be, um, about eight weeks pregnant on that trip. Um, and that was going to be the only competition I was going to be able to attend that year because all of the other competitions were later in the year. And I was going to be more pregnant than would be conducive to uh, good international scores at that point. So, <laughs> yes, yeah. um, however, the day before we were supposed to leave for that France trip, they were still requiring COVID tests. And I tested positive for COVID the day before I was supposed to get on a plane. Um, so could not um, attend that competition. And like I mentioned, I wouldn't have been able to attend any of the other world competitions because I would have been probably five, six months pregnant at that point. Yeah. So. I started my maternity leave um, as soon as uh, my coach got back from that France trip so I could submit the paperwork um, just because I needed a break after Tokyo um, and being Paris being a shortened quad, there wasn't enough time to do that. So if there wasn't anything else that I was going to be able to compete in at that point in time, I decided to take that maternity leave, start it, um, and take a little bit of a break with that if that's possible. Um, <laughs> that's what I mean. Like, do, do you in your backyard? Do you don't have like a range that you just like shoot at when you wake up. I feel like you wake up and go outside, start shooting. <laughs> I was gonna say that is uh, say the house that I, we were living at at that point in time. We did not have the room for a range. Um, one of our goals on our new property, uh, we moved um, while I was pregnant. Actually, don't recommend. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, one of our goals is to put our own um shop slash garage on this property so that we can put an indoor range in it indoor range okay so yeah, for you said that's 10 meters yeah 10 meters and then 50 is outside yes 50 i mean outside so you the wind is really really important at that point then it is yeah, yeah. so we get to learn how to read the wind and uh wait for wind conditions to you know ebb and flow and only shoot in our condition is anything else the size of a period on a piece of paper so 50 meters the target size is a little bit different target oh, okay. is the size of a softball at 50 meters um but bullseye is about the size of a dime so it's okay. bigger but in relation to the distance that we're shooting at it's still tiny plus you're adding wind in there so it's like yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's funny hey that's why it's a professional sport whatever i mean that's cool cool to me <laughs> All right, McKenna, I'll be rooting for you in uh, like 13 it. days. We're almost there. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Have a, have a safe trip out there. Thank you so much for joining us today.
Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate it. All right, cool. Uh, everyone else, thank you for listening to another Fighter Heart podcast. We will see you again next week. Thank you.